includes paintings from the 1500s. It includes stone depictions of Jews before the birth of the Messiah. It includes skulls of ancient Spanish and Portuguese Jews, which match present day Negroes. It includes names of black Portuguese Jews found on the transatlantic slave ship Manifest. And it also includes DNA. Shalom, Shalom, Yisrael. It's your brother, Benea Ben Israel, coming to you with our New Orleans Conference presentation. This is our New Orleans Conference presentation called Hebrew Case Files. Now, the purpose of this presentation is simply to answer a question. What's the difference between an African American and a present day Jew? A while back, I saw a YouTube video where a traditional Christian pastor asked a simple question. He said, how does one go from being an African-American to a Jew? After all, these appear to be two totally different people today. When we think of African-American, we think of someone that's dark skinned, that looks like a, a native African, native born African, you know, black curly hair. And when we think of a present day Jew, the most common picture that pops up is a European. So again, he has a fair question. How does one go from being an African American to being a present day Jew? Well, let's answer that question. We're going to answer that question. And to do that, we're going to use scholastic books, scholastic materials. And in particular, we like using books that are older than the 1900s. So when you open up a book and you look at the at the title page and you also look at the publication date i like we like using books with a publication date of the 1800s or older and the reason why we do that is because the newer books tend to have a different history uh than the one then compared to the ones that are older and of course the ones that are older um it was they were made during a time when there was no ambiguity or when there was no confusion as to who the Jews were and what they looked like. So that is why we use the older references. So what I like to do in, in a lot of these presentations, I always like to start off by reading a few descriptions of the Jews according to the old references. And I do that just so that we can level set and we can reprogram our minds as to what the Jews look like according to the old references. And then from there, we can get into some additional references that tell us what happened to the Jews. But let's first start off by taking a look and reviewing the references that describe the Jews according to the old references. And just one side note, I'm not going to read every single reference as far as like the title and the author and the publication date. If you could please uh, just check out my website, https colon forward slash forward slash Benea, that's B-E-N-A-Y-A-H 
for, you know, the number four, Israel.org. That's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Benea for Israel.org. And if you go there, um, you should be able to find the references for this video. If you don't see them right away, just check back a week or two later and Yah willing, I will have the references for this video on that webpage. All right, praise Yah. Okay, well, let's get started. Let's go through, let's first go through a couple of videos which show or describe the complexion or the physical description of the Jews according to the old references. All right, so in this first reference, it reads, Thus the Jews are a people who have ever, according to the prophecy, dwelt alone without intermixing with the nations to this day. Now, this separate race all descended from brown ancestors. For Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must, has been, must have been as dark as Mar Johanna, if not darker. Exhibit every shade of color from the black Jews of Malabar, of whom, of whom we have such an interesting account by Dr. Claudius Buchanan, to the rose and lily complexion of the Jews on the banks of Elip, which was uh, Germany, I believe. We need to go, or we need go no further than the Jews of Southern Spain and compare them with those of Holland and Northern Germany to perceive a very striking difference. It says the, the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion. I'll say that again. It says the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion and his hair is uniformly black. While as the German Jews is often fair as any German and has light or red hair with blue eyes. All right. So the purpose of reading this reference is to show that the Spanish Jew is always dark complexion always dark complexion and i do want to note that in this video we are going to, we are going to focus exclusively on the spanish and the portuguese jews and the reason why we do that is because the, this is where the transatlantic slave trade started right the transatlantic slave trade started with these two nations so we are going to zero in and take a look at the description of the spanish and the portuguese jews during and before the time of the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, well, let's move on to our next reference. You can see our reference there where it says a new voyage to Italy. And in this reference, it reads, and I'm going to jump down a little bit in our highlighted section where it says, tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews. Uh, let's read that again. It says, "'Tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black, for this is only true of the Portuguese Jews, who marrying always, who marrying always among one another beget children like themselves. And consequently, the swarthiness of their complexion is entailed upon their whole race, even to the Northern regions. All right, well, this is yet another good reference which shows us that the Jews are all black. In particular, the Portuguese Jews are all black. So let's keep going. Our next reference here, and I'm actually just going to read on the right hand side, I believe it's on page 66 near the top. And actually, let me back up here. I'll start at the bottom on the left where it says, a remarkable fact in the history of Luango and the Empire of Congo is that the country, according to a statement which was fully credited by Oldendorp, himself a writer of most correct judgment and of unimpeachable veracity, contains many Jews settled in it who retain their religious rights and the distinct habits which keep them isolated from other nations. Though thus separate from the African population, they are black and resemble the other Negroes in every respect as to physical character. 
It is probably an allusion to this case that Pennington in his textbook, another book, says the descendants of a colony of Jews originally from Judea settled on the coast of Africa are black. All right. And actually, this section at the bottom, just let's read that really quick, where it says the Portuguese who's the Portuguese who planted themselves on the coast of Africa a few centuries ago have been succeeded by descendants blacker than many Africans. All right. So, again, this is another reference to show that the Jews are black. And in particular, there's the Portuguese Jews who were on the west coast of Africa. Uh, are black and we will read a little bit more uh, about that in later on in this presentation okay now on to our next reference and it reads and it says as i tentatively survey the jewish population on the streets of london i fancy i could perceive three different casts of features the first jewish par excellent and never to be mistaken all right so let's take a look at the first form, with this, which is the Jewish form. And if we skip down, it says, of the first form, I need say little to you, begging you merely to recollect that the contour is convex and the eyes long and fine and the outer angles running towards the temples. The brow and the nose apt to form a single convex line and the nose comparatively narrow at the base, the eyes consequently approaching each other. It says, lips very full, mouth projecting, chin small, and the whole physiognomy, or the way they look, when swarthy, or when black, as it often is, so they're often black, it says, has an African look, has an African look. So this is a, a good reference to show us exactly how the Jews look. So before the references merely just touched on color, but I like using this reference because it actually tells us how they looked, right? And it says they looks, the Jews looked African, right? They said they looked African. All right, so let's keep going. Let's go on to our next quote and the narrative travels and discoveries. You can see it there on the screen. So I'm just gonna forward through to our quote and it reads, and I'm just gonna read, uh, jump a little ways down where it says, you are not Jews, said he. No, said I. Christian then, even so. Or, which means yes. And oh, just a little bit of uh, background on this quote before we, we finish it. So this is Hugh Clapperton. Um, he's recounting his uh, interaction with a sheik on the west coast of Africa. So he's recounting the conversation that took place. So Hugh Cap uh, Clapperton, says, um, I'm sorry, that the sheik asked Clapperton, he says, you are not Jews, said he, and the Clapperton re replies, no, said I, Christian then, says the sheik, even so, which means yes, replied Cla reply Clapperton, replied I, and the sheik says, I have read of you, you are better than Jews, said he, are Jews white like you? No, replied I, rather more like yourself very dark all right well i like using this reference just so that it helps explain or show that the understanding back in the 1800s was that the jews were black it's not that the jews were white it's that the understanding was that the jews are black all right well, let's keep going and on to our next quote which reads and read at the top of the uh, highlighted section it says thus the black color is found not only in individuals as the black jews of portugal but in the tribes of the bacaris on the red sea whose hair and character are perfectly symmetric all right so again uh this reference is helping to drive home the fact that the uh, understanding in uh, you know, 200, 300 years ago was that the Portuguese Jews and the Spanish Jews were and are black, right? They are black. All right, so on to our next quote, and this comes from Baruch Spinoza. Now, Baruch Spinoza is a Jew himself. I believe it's, he's, he's a Portuguese Jew. This is a valuable reference because this is a self-description uh, coming from a Jew, right? So let's see what Baruch Spinoza has to say. And it reads, he was of a middle size. He had good features in his face, 
the skin somewhat black, black curly hair, long eyebrows, and of the same color, so that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. Now, the a good takeaway from this reference shows us that the understanding was that they could tell by the looks of someone that they were a Portuguese Jew. They could tell that if the skin was somewhat black and the hair was black and curly, that he was descended from a Portuguese Jew. That's that's what they associated that look to be. That was the look of a Portuguese Jew. All right. So let's move on. Now, this um, this reference just kind of helps help shed some light on the description of the Jews that were living around the Valley of the Jordan. And it reads with reference to the characteristic of color, which are extreme. We have now opportunities of knowing how much of that character is the result of the influence of climate. Now, and just a side note, so back in the day, they used to think that climate affected whether a person was black or, or white. But um, so we, of course, we know better now, but just know that that was the, the thought process back then. But it says we know it more particularly by the most valuable mode of teaching such influences, which we derive from the peculiarity of the Jewish race. And it reads, for 1800 years, that race has been dispersed in different latitudes and climates, and they have preserved themselves distinct from intermixture with the other races or with other races of mankind. There are Jews, there are some Jews still lingering in the valleys of the Jordan, having been oppressed by the succession, successive conquerors of Syria for ages a low race of people and described by trustworthy travelers as being as black as any of the Ethiopian races. All right. So this is a good reference to show that even the Jews that were living in the Valley of the Jordan, that trustworthy travelers described the Jews as being as black as any of the Ethiopian races. All right. Now, on to our next quote. All right, it reads. Actually, let's just jump down to the underlying uh, sentence here where it says the Jews of Portugal are very dark. All right. So again, that reference is self-explanatory. And even in this index, you can see where it says Jews black <laughs> jews black and that's what we see in this index in this in the back of this book all right so on to our next reference and this one and this reference comes from john Mackey, and this book was written in the 1700s and for this one i believe uh this book he was describing uh like a head of state and he goes on with his description and he says he hath also the exterior air of business an application enough to make him very capable in his habit and manners very formal a tall thin very black man like a spaniard or a jew about 50 years old all right so this is a good reference to show you that a tall thin black man at the understanding that that person looked like a Spaniard or a Jew. Now, how different is that from the description or the description that pops in, in our minds today when we watch the five o'clock news and they describe a describe a, a person of being a tall, thin, very black man, right? A, a, a different mindset or a different idea pops into our minds when we hear that on the five o'clock news. We definitely don't think of a of a Spaniard or a Jew today, do we? We think of somebody else, right? But, you know, in the 1700s, when someone said tall, thin, very black man, the idea that came to mind was a Spaniard or a Jew. So you can see that as we go through these references, we are, what we're doing is that we're showing that the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews did not look like Europeans. Instead, the Spanish and the Portuguese Jews looked like the so-called African Americans. And 
once we have this foundation, we are then able to go into the history to see exactly what happened to the Jews just before the transatlantic slave trade and during the transatlantic slave trade to see why the present day Jews and the African, so-called African-Americans, as well as those that have been scattered via the transatlantic slave trade, you can see why we are all the same people, all right? We are all one people, okay? All right, so we've, we've uh, reviewed the color of the Jews or the description of the Jews, and we've proven that the Jews of Spain and Portugal are similar or look just like the so-called African American today. All right. So on to our next section. And in our next section, let's review the home of the Jew. Let me ask you a question. Where did the Jews live? So now that we understand that the Jews are always dark complexion and all black, where do these dark complexion, all black Jews live? Well, let's take a look. Let's first start off by taking a look at the Webster Dictionary. And let's take a look at the word ghetto. And let's take a look at the first uh, definition. It says ghetto, a quarter of a city in which Jews were formerly required to live. <laughs> ghetto, a quarter of a city in which the Jews were formerly required to live. So let's cross check our reference by looking at a few other additional references. But so far, according to Webster, the Jews lived in ghettos. So these dark complexion, all black people lived in ghetto. Do, let me ask you a question. Do African-Americans, have we been known to live in ghettos? Yes, we have, right? Yes, we have. But let's keep reading. Let's read some additional references. And it says in the 1610s, it says part ghetto, part of a city in which the Jews are compelled to live. All right. It says, especially in Italy, from Italian ghetto. All right. So let's keep going. Let's get some additional references, which reads. And it says, Venice, imitating the odious measures of the German cities, assigned to the Jews as a special quarter ghetto. All right. Let's keep going. Let's get some more additional references to see where these dark complexion, all black Jews had to live. And it says Portugal as a former Jewish ghetto or Judearia. And that's one thing to note that in Portugal, the uh, word for ghetto was Judearia, right? And this is where the Jews were required to live. And actually, in fact, today there are places that are clearly marked as Judearia today over in Portugal. So this is where the Jews, these all black, dark complexion Jews had to live. And let's just read one more reference. And it says Jewish quarter known as Judearia. It says in Lisbon, the chief city, there were several Judearias and in all their cities, Jewish quarters exist, existed. And it says these Judearias were closed every evening when the bell sounded for prayers and were guarded by two watchmen appointed by the king. Any Jew found outside of Judearia after the first three tolls of the bell was fined 10, 10 liveries or according to an order of King Dom Pedro was whipped through the city and in case of repetition of the offense punished with confiscation of his property. So now, just reviewing what we've learned so far, we've learned that the Jews of Spain and Portugal were all black, dark complexion Jews. And we also learned that they lived in ghettos, right? That they lived in ghettos. All right, so now we are starting to see some similarities or hopefully we're seeing some similarities between the so-called African-Americans and the Jews just before the transatlantic slave trade started. All right, so now let's take a look at the names that were used to describe Jews, right? So let's take a look at different names that were used to describe Jews. And to do that, let's first take a look at the word Negro. Let's take a look at the word Negro. So so-called African-Americans today are called Negro, right? Or were called Negro at some point in time. Are we identified as Negroes at some point in time? 
So let's take a look at the etymology of the word Negro. So according to etymology online, and also according to, I believe it was Webster Dictionary and some other dictionaries, we see that the word Negro in the 1550s, and it's actually in 1555, but in 1550s, it says the word Negro meant a member of a black skinned race of Africa. I mean, let me read that again. In 1550s, the word Negro meant the member or a member of a black skinned race of Africa. But we can see that before the 1550s, the word Negro meant something else, right? The word Negro meant something else. So we can confirm this not only in the encyclopedias, but we can also con we, we can also confirm this in looking at the etymology of the word. So according to that etymology of the word, it says the word Negro before 1550s meant Portuguese black. The word Negro simply meant Portuguese black, right? And if you want to look at that on a timeline, you can see, you know, from the 1555 to the right, which is up to present day, that the word Negro meant an African people. But to the left, the word Negro, you know, meant, according to the etymology, it meant Portuguese black. But I'll put a couple of question marks here because we don't know what people it was referred to. We know the word Negro meant Portuguese black, but we don't know what people it was referring to. So to answer that question, let's read a couple of references to, to see if we can answer that question. All right. So our first reference, it reads... In Portugal, the name of a Jew is a term of such high reproach that the government found it necessary to enact a law which forbid any person to call another by that appellation. If a man who is styled a Jew or if a man who is called a Jew to his face stabs the offender, it says the law does not condemn him. And trifling as this regulation may appear, it is it has produced beneficial effects. In other words, it was very effective. So the takeaway from this reference is that the Jews were called by another name because there was a law that prevented people in Portugal from calling a Jew a Jew. Right. So the Jews couldn't be called a Jew. It says they had to be called by a, a different name, or at least in this reference, it says that the term Jew was of such high repro reproach that it was against the law to call a person by that name. So then the question comes, what were the Jews called? Right. What were the Jews called? So to answer that question, let's go on to our next reference. And it reads. King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas, which had been discovered in 1471, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And it says, from these banished Jews, it says, the black Portuguese, as they are called. All right, it says, the black Portuguese as they are called. So let's note a few things here. It says the banished Jews were called black Portuguese, right? The banished Jews from King John II. So King John II is the king of Portugal and he's calling these Jews black Portuguese, right? The Jews are called black Portuguese. Well, we need to remember that the Portuguese word for black is Negro, right? So if we go back to our our uh, etymology of the word Negro, we can see Negro, Portuguese, black, right? We see Negro, Portuguese, black. And, and one thing I do want to point out was that the um, note the note the date here. So it's King John the Second. This is in 1492. So in 1492, they were called black Portuguese, which is or Negro Portuguese, because remember the Portuguese word for black was Negro. So in 1492, which is before the 1550 date, right? So before the 1550s, right? So remember, look at our uh, our, our um, etymology of the word Negro here. It says Negro 1550s. So it, before 1550s, we just read a quote that referred that referred to the 1492. So that would be in this box right here. And within this box, a 
according to the references says the Jews were referred to as Portuguese right here black Portuguese black which is Negro all right so hopefully you can see that the Jews were called Negroes that was one of the, the terms for the Jews now let's move on to one of the more controversial names of the Jews and to do that, we're going to take a look at a very controversial name. It's a it's a byword. It's a d derogatory word used today, uh, which causes great pain. But the word or this derogatory word is N I G G E R, or pronounced nigger. Now, according to the Oxford Dictionary, it's important for us to realize that it wasn't always spelled with two G's. According to Oxford Dictionary, it was spelled with one G. Uh, especially in the 1500s or 1600s and that it wasn't until recently that it was being spelled or that it was spelled with two G's and so what that means is that the um, anytime you see N-I-G-E-R it is supposed to be pronounced nigger now why are we reading about the Oxford Dictionary and the way that the word nigger was spelled well it's important because According to A.J. Rogers, the slaves that were taken from the Nigger River Delta were called after that name. So, in other words, the slaves that were taken from the, you know, what we refer to today as the Niger River. However, back during the time of antiquity, it was called the Nigger River. So slaves that were taken from the Nigger River were called niggers which was the derogatory name. So in this, um, these quotes or this reference, let's take a look to see what slaves or what people were living around the Nigger River. And for that, let's take a look at John Ogilvy. And this is uh, from his book, Africa being an, an accurate description of the regions. Now this book, if you wanna find this book today or buy this book today, the hard copy, I believe it's on sale for 20, thousand dollars right twenty thousand dollars and you have to wonder why would a book cost twenty thousand dollars well of course it's about the material that's inside these books or the truth that's inside these books and of course a price of twenty thousand um, dollars slaves that were taken from the nigger river nigger river delta were called after that name. So in other words, the slaves that were taken from the, you know, what we refer to today as the Niger River. However, back during the time of antiquity, it was called the Nigger River. So slaves that were taken from the Nigger River were called niggers, which was the derogatory name. So in this, um, these quotes or this reference, let's take a look to see what slaves or what people were living around the Nigger River. And for that, let's take a look at John Ogilvy. And this is uh, from his book, Africa being an, an accurate description of the regions. Now, this book, if you want to find this book today or buy this book today, the hard copy, I believe it's on sale for $20,000, right? $20,000. And you have to wonder why would a book cost $20,000? Well, of course, it's about the material that's inside these books or the truth that's inside these books. And of course, a price of $20,000 um, helps prevent this book or it prevents this book from making it into mainstream, right? It prevents this book from being seen by the masks. Okay, so let's take a look at John Ogilvy's book about Africa. And on page 34, it reads, many Jews also are scattered over this region. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed, inhabiting both sides of the river Nigger. All right. So now this reference shows us that on the west coast of Africa, near the river Nigger, that the Jews were scattered over the region and that they also inhabited both sides of that river. Right. So now we know what people were living in the Nigger River region and what people eventually became the slaves. However, we haven't really proved that these were the uh, slaves just yet. We actually have that covered in some other references. But for now, we're just establishing the fact that it was the Jews that lived around the Nigger River or lived in the Nigger River Delta region. All right. So as we keep going, it says others are Asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian 
And um, oh, let me just pause here just to let you know that this this quote also goes into detail to show us that the Jews that were living near the Nigger River region wasn't just the Spanish Jews. No, it was the Jews that had fled from Jerusalem or the Jews that came from Jerusalem, that the Jews that fled or came from Jerusalem at different points in time. So the Jews continuously came from the homeland of Israel into the West Coast of Africa. So just know that it wasn't it wasn't a singular event that led the Jews over to the West Coast of Africa. Just know that the Jews in waves, you know, in waves, in waves of migration uh, came over to the West Coast of Africa. And this quote actually speaks to that. So it says the some Jews uh, sees others, Asian strangers who fled thither from the desolation of Jerusalem by, by Vespasian. So when Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD, the Jews came over to the west coast of Africa. Then it says, or from Judea, wasted and depopulated by the Romans. So when the Romans depopulated it later, the Jews fled over to the west coast of Africa. It says Persians. So when the Persians destroyed, um, came against Jerusalem, they fled to the west coast of Africa. Saracens and Christians, likewise. Then it says, or else came out of Europe where they were banished. So. The Jews were banished out of Europe, and as they were banished out of Europe, according to our reference, John Ogilvy, uh, who was the, the cosmographer and geographic printer of the king. So this is a, one a person of um, of authority, and he has a has a uh, a seat of authority, or he's next to a person with the seat of authority. And John Ogilvy goes also tells us that the Jews were kicked out of Spain and um, out of the Low Country in 1350, out of France and out of England. And it says they all differ in habit and are divided into several tribes having no dominion, though both wealthy and numerous, but despised of all nations and so abominated by the Turks that they are not admitted to be Mohammedans. And it says, and then no wise, no otherwise made use of than to receive their customs and to gather their taxes. All right. OK, so just to, let's review, you know, the purpose of reading this reference is just to show you that the Jews that were the Jews, it was the Jews that lived near the Nigger River Delta region. And these were the slaves that were taken from the Nigger River Delta region were called niggers. All right, well, let's keep reading. So another controversial name, uh, especially in, in Africa, in the continent of, that, of Africa is Caffrey or Caffrey. So according to our references, uh, let's read um, this reference by Leo Africanus and it says, the people of this place called in the Arabian tongue, Kafir, Kafirs, or Kafates, that is to say, lawless or outlaws, are for the most part exceedingly, are exceeding black of color. All right. So we can see that the people that were Kafirs, first of all, they were called outlaws or lawless. That's important that they were, these people were referred to as lawless, right? And if we read the little section below it, it says, these slaves are esteemed its strongest, most robust, courageous, faithful, and obedient in the world. And so are they thus highly prized. It says, they are all Negroes. You see that? They are all Negroes. And the Portuguese call them Kaffirs, which, are, which, you know, according to the reference above it, it means lawless. You get it? Lawless. Which meant that they were Christians, by the way. All right, so let's keep reading. And let's read another reference by Leo Africanus where he goes on to say, he says, some also think that the people called Caffrey or Caffates at this day who are Gentiles draw their original from the Jews. But being environed on every side by idolaters, they have by little and little swayed from the law of Moses and so are become, as it were, insensibly idolaters. All right. So Leo Africanus goes on to point out that there were many during the time that or there were some during the time that believed the Kaffirs were Jews as well. All right. And that they were lawless, by the way, according to the previous reference. 
Okay, so let's take a quick review of what we've learned so far. So we learned that the Jews of Spain and Portugal were all black, are always dark complexion and all black, right? So this is what we learned. And then we took a look at the we took a look at the place of where these Jews lived and we found out that the Jews lived in ghettos. So these all black, always dark complexion people lived in ghettos, uh, again, just before the transatlantic slave trade, right? Just before the transatlantic slave trade. And then we went on to learn that the Jews were called by different names. We learned that they were called Negroes. And we also learned that they were called niggers, or they were associated with niggers, the term nigger. And then last but not least, they were also associated with the term Kaffir or Kaffirs, right? All right, so on to our next section. So now that, we, now that we know that, let's take a look at where did these Jews go? So the Jews, if we don't know, if you don't know, the Jews were in Spain and Portugal in great numbers. So after, the Moors and the Jews um, ruled Spain for many years. And we know that they were also in you know, Spain and Portugal because even today, if you go to Portugal, there is a section called Judearia, which is the, called the ghettos, and that's where the Jews live. So we know that the Jews and the Moors were there, right? And they ruled there from 711 AD, roughly to around uh, 1492 AD. But the question is, where did they go? Where did they go? So let's read a couple of references just to get an idea of where these Spanish and Portuguese Jews um, were sent. Spain. So in 1492, on the same day that Jerusalem uh, fell, Spain expelled their Jews from Spain and many of the Jews fled into Portugal. So the question we need to ask is how many of the Jews from Spain fled into Portugal? And for that, let's take a look at some of the older references where it says, and this is in, you know, you can see in 1492 where it says at Granada, 1492. Um, and let's see if we can find a good place to start where it says, the number of those who were thus banished from Spain were 400,000 Jews, according to Ruchelin and others. So this initial initial estimate is 400,000 Jews. And let's keep it into perspective now. That's 400,000 of all always dark complexion, all black Jews that were living in ghettos. So 400,000 of those Jews that were always dark complexion, all dark, lived in ghettos and um, were called Negroes, right? And at the time they were called Negroes. All these Negroes were expelled from Spain. And let's keep reading. It says, most writers affirm that there were 170 families, or 170,000 families, right now we're talking about groups. And it says, others say that there were 800,000 persons, right? So 800,000 persons left Spain and came over into Portugal. And it's important here to, to note that that the Jews that were coming into Portugal, that, they, that the numbers that we're reading so far are just the Jews coming into Portugal. There's no mention of the number of Jews that were already in Portugal, right? So in other words, it's 800,000 or 400,000 plus the two, roughly 200,000 or so Jews that were already in Portugal. And as you can see where it says a prodigious number, the takeaway here is to know that, that there were a lot of Jews that were expelled and they fled into Portugal. In some cases, you may have a, roughly around a million Jews or a little bit less than that. In either case, it was a lot of people. Now, if you're looking at your screen, what you're looking at is a picture of a concert that took place in Woodstock. And this, this was back in the 70s. And this concert is known because of the uh, the number of people that attended. I believe the rough estimate was 600,000 people. So what you're looking at is a picture of what 600,000 people would look like. And if you notice, all the people that they couldn't all fit in the frame. So we're only looking at a small, at a portion of 600,000 people. 
And if you, you take a look at that and in your mind, you can envision an all black people, always dark complexion that lived in ghettos and that were called Negroes, 600,000, this is what they would have looked like. And as you can tell, this was a big event. This was a, a, a colossal event that occurred less than 10 years before the transatlantic slave trade started. So less than 10 years before the transatlantic slave trade started, you had you know roughly around this many people leaving Spain and going over to Portugal just before the transatlantic slave trade, which started in 1501. And after they came into Portugal and, you know, of course, the king of Portugal only admitted them into Portugal with the, um, you know, with the understanding that they would only stay there for six months and that each person had to pay eight to six. I believe it was either six or eight pieces of gold. And if they couldn't pay that amount of money, they had their children taken away from them. Right. They had their children taken away from them. And that too was a major event. And this is where I tell folks is that just before the transatlantic slave trade, we have a quite a few major events happen back to back to back, right? Back to back to back. And this was truly a time of Jacob's trouble. Now, we're going to take a look at this reference because this reference shows us or confirms that the Jews that were over in Portugal, that something happened to them while they were in Portugal. And it's let's, let's hear from the official chronicler of Garcia de Resendi, who was the official chronicler of King John II. And it reads, it says, King, the official chronicler of King John II, Garcia de Resendi, reports on one of the methods to populate this island that also throws some light on the tragic form of Jewish participation in the Portuguese Atlantic Empire. It reads, the king had allowed Jewish refugees from Spain from where they had been expelled in 1492, so the Jewish refugees had been expelled in Spain, 1492, to remain in Portugal only in return for payment of an enormous ransom. Let's talk about that. In 1493, those who could not pay had their children taken away from them, baptized by force and deported or sent to Sao Tome, which was the west or which is the west coast of Africa, in order to be raised as Christians, one, and to help populate the island, two. So the takeaway here is that the children were taken away from their parents in great numbers, or I'm sorry, we haven't proven that they were taken there in great numbers, but we'll read some references later to show that it was that the children were taken in great numbers to the west coast of Africa. And the purpose was twofold. One, they were to be raised as Christians. And two, they were sent there to populate the island. And as we look through our references, we find out that on Sao Tome, they established breeding farms. They established breeding farms for the, these children to have more babies and populate the island. And eventually we'll want to explore that to see exactly what happened to these babies that were born on the west coast of Africa that were also raised to be Christians, right? They were raised to be Christians and they were sent to breeding farms. And what I tell people is that one of the unique characteristics of so-called African Americans is that we do not know our history. If you speak to some of our fellow Africans over on the West Coast of Africa, they know their history. You know, they will be able to tell you that their oral history and it goes back for many years and that they have practices that go back many years. But one of the distinct characteristics of the so-called African American is that we do not know our history. And you have to ask yourself, how do you get a person to not know their history or to not have an oral tradition passed down to them? Well, in order to do that, you have to separate the children from the parents. And we see this on the West Coast of Africa, that the children of the Jews were separated from their parents. Now, let's read a, a couple of a few other references to, to prove our point. As far as the children being separated from their parents, and it says, 
Unfortunately, during the time of the expulsion, the plague was raging in Castile, which was uh, Spain. And it says the fugitives brought with them the disease, propagating it wherever they went and not unnaturally causing their advent to be viewed with loathing and horror. So basically, the Jews were, were as they fled from Spain, they were under the curses of Deuteronomy 28. And one of the curses was that the disease would follow the Jews wherever they went. So as these Jews came into Portugal, just like the Bible said, it would, the disease followed them into Portugal. And it said this circumstance induced King John to hasten their departure from Portugal. So in other words, with that disease, King John wanted the Jews to get out. And for which purpose ships were duly provided according to the agreement. So it says King John provided some ships. It says, but such was the temper of the captains and the sailors that they subjected the Jews to the hardest possible condition. It said they plundered them of their goods and valuables even to their very clothes and landed them naked and bare of everything on barren points of the African coast, leaving them to die of starvation or to be sold into slavery to the Moors. Nor was that all or nor was this all the king rested from their parents all the children between the ages of three and ten of those jews of those jewish immigrants who from poverty or otherwise had omitted to pay the capitation tax on entering on entering or who were forced to remain in portugal and had their and had them transported to the newly discovered islands of St. Thomas, which was swarmed with alligators and other beasts of prey to be brought up as Christians. So again, in this reference, we learn that the children of the Jews were sent to the west coast of Africa. And again, this one confirms that they were to be raised as Christians. And also, this reference also shows that it wasn't just the children of the Jews that couldn't pay the uh, capitation tax. But it was also the Jews that remained after the deadline had passed. Those Jews also had their children taken away from them. So the king of Portugal actually gave these Jews an option. And the option was, it was the same option that, that Spain gave the Jews. It was like, you could either convert to Christianity or you had to leave. So the whole reason why our ancestors left Spain was because they refused to throw away the laws, statutes, and the commandments of the Most High. They would rather sell their goods, sell their property, endure hardships, leave the country that they lived in, rather than throw away the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. This speaks volumes to our ancestors and to our forefathers. It speaks volumes to their character. And not only that, once they left Spain and came over to Portugal, again, they were asked to or given the option of turning to Christianity or they had to leave the country and they would also have their children taken away from them, right? And yet our forefathers still refused to throw away the laws, statutes and commandments of the Most High Yah, right? So again, this speaks of the character of our forefathers and the evil actions of Spain and Portugal during this time. All right, so let's keep reading. Let's read our next reference, which reads, the Jews after their admission into Portugal were no less unfortunate than other exiles from Spain. It says, in the year 1493, when King John II conferred the singlery of St. Thomas Isles upon Don Alvaro, it says, he obliged the latter to people the island, so again, this too is confirming what we've read so far. And it says, and for this purpose ordered that all the Jews should have their, their sons and daughters of tender age taken away from them. And that after the baptism of the latter, these should be handed over as was done to Don Alvaro for the purpose of peopling the said island of St. Thomas. So again, their purpose was to go into breeding farms to people the island, to have babies, right? To have babies on the island. And as the reference said, to be raised as Christians. All right. 
So hopefully we're starting, we should know that this was a major, major, major event. This was a major event of having these children taken to the west coast of Africa. Now let's keep in mind that these are the children that were always dark complexion, all black, they lived in ghettos, they were called Negroes, and they were expelled from Spain over into Portugal, and now they're being placed on the west coast of Africa into breeding farms, being raised as Christians, less than 10 years before the transatlantic slave trade. I think I just need to say that just one more time, and I'm sorry I'm repeating myself, but I just want to make sure we grasp what just happened, right? So over in Spain and Portugal, so we had 800,000, 400,000, always dark complexion, all black Jews who lived in ghettos, right, who called Negroes, were, they were expelled and came over to Portugal, right, because they refused to throw away the most high yas law, statutes, and commandments. And once we got over there, the children of the Jews were taken away and sent over to the west coast of Africa to become Christians and to go into breeding farms so that they can populate the islands, have babies, right? Okay, so now that we understand that, let's go over to our next, next quote. And the next reference reads, thy sons and thy daughters have been given unto another people. How exactly has this prophecy been fulfilled in several countries, especially in Spain and Portugal? In the former of these kingdoms, the Council of Toledo decreed that the children of the Jews should be taken from them and educated in the Christian faith. When they were expelled, all under 14 years of age were forcibly detained to be baptized. And I will note that in other references, it shows that later the uh, the king increased the age from 14. Just in all the references that we've read so far, you know, we're strictly focusing on the children from, uh, I believe, the ages of three and ten. Uh, but it's also important to note that the king later increased the age of children that were taken from their parents to children in their 20s or young adults in their 20s. Right. Like I, again, like I said, this was a major, major, major event just before the transatlantic slave trade starts. All right. So let's keep reading. It says the first design of settling there was in the year 1486. But perceiving how many perished in the attempt in that they could better agree with that of the continent on the coast of Guinea. It was resolved by King John II of Portugal that all the Jews within his dominion, listen, it says, which were vastly numerous. All right. So this confirms that the Jews that came over into his kingdom or the Jews that were Jews that were living in his kingdom were vastly numerous. There was a lot of them, right? Because we were reading 800,000, 400,000, and we were also looking at that picture of Woodstock just to see what 600,000 people looked like of all black Negroes looked like, right? And it says, should be obliged to receive baptism or upon refusal. So again, they were obliged to see receive the baptism, the baptism of Roman Christianity, right? Of the Roman version of Christianity or upon refusal be transported to the coast of Guinea where the Portuguese had already considerable or several considerable settlements and a good trade considering the time since its first discovery. So again, we see time and time again that the whole reason why the children were placed on the west coast of Africa was because our forefathers refused to throw away the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High Yah. So the Portuguese and the Spaniards took the children away from the parents in order to reprogram or to raise these children up to, to throw away the law, statutes, and commandments. In other words, that was the only way that they could get the Jews to throw away the most highest law, statutes, and commandments was to take the children away from the mothers and their fathers, give them to complete strangers, and raise them to be Christians. And as you will see in this next quote, raise them to be slaves. All right, so let's read it. In this reference, it says, 
all Jewish children below 14 years of age were torn from their parents' arms, dragged into the church, baptized. And it says those under three years of age were given to Christians. So let's let's pause here for a moment. So the children from, you know, from infant, you know, newborn to three years old. Right. And that's uh, daycare. I believe that's the, the children that you would find in daycares today. These children were taken from their parents. And again, what I tell people is that this was a major event that happened. And this is why you find this event in numerous sources, because a lot of people were writing about it. You know, anytime you're if you can imagine trying to take a child from their parents, that is a major altercation incurred. And in some other references, it goes in and it describes how they did it. It shows that they were they used clubs and violently used those clubs on the mothers and fathers and hitting them. And, you know, you can imagine them hitting them on the head and the damage that incurred and parents strewn all over the ground as they were knocked out or killed by these clubs and other instruments that they used to separate the children. And in some of these these references, it talks about the whales. Right. If you separating a, a three-year-old or a 10-year-old or a child from their mothers you know the, of course the children are going to be screaming whether it be mothers or, or the sons or daughters the fathers are going to be screaming the the wives are going to be screaming and on top of that this happened to a large body of people so this was a thousands of people that this happened to on a, on a particular day so this was a day to be remembered Right. This was a day that a lot of people were talking about because there was just so much going on. You had the, the children being taken and thrown onto the ships. And even as the ships were pulling out, you can imagine that the children were still crying out to their mothers and fathers. And, you know, and as the, the mothers or fathers heard their children screaming that they even there's there's even references that talk about parents jumping into the water after the ships and trying to swim after the ships only to drown in the waves and then for their dead bodies to wash ashore again this was a major event and keep in mind that these were always dark complexion all dark people that lived in ghettos that were called negroes make this matter even worse these children were going a way to be raised by complete strangers that hated them right you know uh, i can't exp i can't spend enough time describing this event but just know that this was a major event but let's keep reading so the first we stopped off by reading that the, the children under three years of age were torn from their parents and given to christians and it says to receive a christian education and then it says or in other words to be raised as slaves so here we see the intention of raising these children as christians was to be the intention was for these children to be slaves i'll say it again the intention was for these children were to be slaves and to be christians right so it was you know, now if we're keeping track, there is we're, we see that there are three purposes for the children to be taken from their parents. They were to be raised as Christians and they were to become slaves and they were to people the island or they were to go into breeding farms. Those three things. And let's finish up this reference. And it says those between the ages of three and 10 years old were put on board of a ship conveyed to the newly discovered unwholesome island of St. Thomas. All right. So I do want to point out that at this point, Portugal is raising up two groups of slaves. I'll say it again. At this point, Portugal was raising up two groups of slaves. So the, remember the children from the ages of under the ages of three years old were given to Christians in Portugal to be raised as slaves or Portugal and, and possibly Spain to be raised as slaves. So we have a group of slaves that were being raised in Portugal, but then we have children sent to the West coast of Africa to be raised as slaves as well. And I believe, let's see those. And if I jump down to the bottom of the box there, the red box that it says those between 10 and 14 years were sold as slaves. All right. So again, Keep in mind that we're starting to see 
two groups of slaves form just before the transatlantic slave trade. We have slaves in the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal. And now we have slaves, uh, we're raising slaves on the west coast of Africa. All right. Again, this is less than 10 years before the transatlantic slave trade. And I put this reference in just so that we can see that when the slaves were expelled from Spain and Portugal, that this occurred over a span of time. For example, in this reference, it reads, the northern coast of Africa and the inhabitable regions inland were full of Jews of Spanish descent. Right, were full of Jews of Spanish descent. It says they had congregated there in great numbers during the century from the persecution of 1391 to their total expulsion, which was in you know 1493. So again, you know, this reference shows us that the Jews were in great numbers over in Africa. You know, and of course, we don't see that in these modern day books. So again, this is why I point people to these older books. Now, I do want to make note of one thing is that if you ever heard of the term of Negro land, right? If you ever heard people talk about maps of uh, West Africa or Northern Africa, where you see Negro land or so you Dan, what I also tell folks is that if you do your homework, You'll be hard pressed to find a map with Negro land or so you Dan uh, identified before these Spanish Jews were kicked out. In other words, you won't find and I, I challenge folks to go in to go and do their research to see if you can find a, um, a map of Negro land before the Jews were expelled from Spain and Portugal. In other words, it wasn't until after these Spanish or Portuguese Jews were expelled from, from the Iberian Peninsula, then you see Negro land show up on maps. And remember, you know, Negro, the word Negro is Spanish and Portuguese. So it makes sense that we see Negro, Spanish and Portuguese word for black land in Africa after these Jews of Spanish descent were kicked out. All right. So I just want to point that out. All right. So let's keep going. So in our next reference, this is a good reference just to show what happened to the children. It says the Castilian Jews who from poverty or any other cause had not departed at the limited time. The king ordered should be taken for slaves over in the Iberian Peninsula. And it says, according to the terms of their entrance, and it says, and distributed them to whoever asked for them. His inhumanity did not cease there. It says, he tore their young children from them and had them baptized. Being at the time desirous of peopling his newly discovered acquisition on the coast of Africa, going into breeding farms. Then it says, the island of, of St. Thomas, he sent them to it with the new governor, Alvaro, and it says, so that by being, listen, it says, so that by being separated from their parents and marrying people in the island, they might become good Christians. All right. So you can see this reference gives insight to the whole purpose of separating the children from their parents so that they could raise or, or reprogram these children to throw away the law, statutes and commandments of the most high. Right, to throw away the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. And I do want to take time to point out that a lot of times, you know, they didn't persecute or expel these Jews uh, because they did not believe in Mashiach. Because what you'll see in some of these other references, you, if not in this video, you'll see it in some other, other videos, that there were some Jews that actually did believe in Mashiach, but they were persecuted mainly for following the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High God. Unfortunately, they, they became what's referred to as new Christians. In other words, they surcame to the pressures and became you know, Roman Christians. And when they became Roman Christians, they were termed new Christians. And so even though they became new Christians, they too were targeted by the Inquisition and also either killed or expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. So again, it wasn't because they did not believe in Hamashiach, our Messiah. It, that wasn't the reason why they were being persecuted. It was because they were attempting to follow the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High God. 
That's why they were being persecuted. And on to our next reference, which reads, Barbet states that in the reign of King John II and about the close of the 15th century, it says, large numbers of Jews were expelled from Portugal and taken to the coast of Southern Guinea, all right, which is the west coast of Africa, all right. So again, um, you know, the purpose of showing this reference to show you that there were large numbers of always dark complexion, all dark Jews who lived in ghettos, who uh, were called Negroes, were these large numbers of Jews, the children were being sent to the West Coast of Africa. All right. All right. So hopefully we have enough references to at least prove that these black Jews were being placed on the West Coast of Africa in great numbers less than 10 years before the start of the transatlantic slave trade. All right, but let's read a quick reference about the transatlantic slave trade because most folks don't know that when the transatlantic slave trade started in the year 1501, between the year 1501 and 1518, that the slaves came from Spain and Portugal. I'll say it again. The first slaves of the transatlantic slave trade the first slaves of the transatlantic slave trade came from the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal. And you can find that in a charter uh, that was written to the Emperor Charles uh, V. And you can see a copy of the charter. I mean, the original document is, is up to the top. It's hard to read. It's in uh, cursive, I believe. But you can read the, um, the summary right just below it where it says, all right, this charter granted by Emperor Charles V to Lorenzo de Gorovod for permission to transport slaves. It says Spain in 18 August, 1518, courtesy of the archives in Spain. And it says before 1518, the slave trade was highly regulated and consistent mostly of slaves being brought from Spain to the Americas directly by the Spanish government. All right, so these slaves didn't come from Africa. The first slaves of the transatlantic slave trade came from the Iberian Peninsula or Spain and Portugal. All right, so in, let's read uh, just another reference. This is um, a reference by John Ogilby. It's America. Um, you can see the, the title there on the screen. I just want to show you that a lot of this truth is it is captured in books. It's just that the books that they're captured in, you know, they're often priced very high. Right. For instance, like this book uh, by John Ogilby, you can find like if you wanted to try to get a hard copy of this book, this book will cost you sixty five thousand dollars. Right. $65,000. And you got to ask yourself, why would a book cost $65,000? And, you know, it's, it's really because of the truth that's contained in these books. It's about the truth that's contained in these books. And let me show you, like, for instance, in this book that's cost $65,000, if you go over to page uh, 574, it has something interesting to say about the, um, you know, the children of the Jews that were placed on the west coast of Africa, because remember, you know, all the references that we read up, read up to now, you know, told us that the Jews were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers. But let's see what this sixty five thousand dollar book has to say about those Jews who were placed on the west coast of Africa. And it says John, the third king of Portugal, sent a colony thither above 200 years before. Whom though the unwholesome air destroyed, yet the place was not left desolate. For he sent new inhabitants who first settled Guinea, which is the west coast of Africa, next in Angola, west coast of Africa, and lastly on the island of St. Thomas, west coast of Africa, that so they might be better used to the air. And it says that the said king sold all those Jews for slaves that refused to embrace the Roman religion. So it tells us that the whole reason why these black Jews went into slavery was because they refused to throw away the laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High God. 
right? That's the whole reason why they went into slavery. And it says that refused to embrace the Roman religion. It says, listen, it says, and cause their children to be baptized from whom these children coming thither in great numbers, West Coast of Africa, it says most of the present inhabitants were descended. So according to this reference, most of the present inhabitants of the West Coast of Africa were descended. And we can understand that because remember in the other references, we saw that these children were sent to populate. They were sent there to populate. And in fact, they were sent over to breeding farms. They were sent over to breeding farms. All right. All right. So I you know, just want to take a quick review of the uh, of our timeline, just so that you can see if you look at the time mark of uh, 1492, where the you see where the Jews were expelled from Spain and then you see they were expelled from Portugal, placed on the west coast of Africa. And then shortly thereafter, the transatlantic slave trade kicks off. All right. The transatlantic slave trade starts.